day for her. <laughs> um, good evening. How are you all? Uh, thanks for coming out, and it's already coming off. Um, so, uh, as the introduction stated, I'm Greg Herman from the Fay Jones School of Architecture and Design. And uh, my first uh, uh, involvement in a meaningful way with uh, the architecture of Faye Jones beyond just knowing Faye and Gus as I did since I've been at the university since 1991 was in 2010, six years after uh, Faye passed away and uh, Gus, his widow, was getting ready to uh, move into long-term care. In 2010, uh, Faye and Gus, or Gus anyway, had been living in the, the Jones house since 1956, since it was completed. Uh, and it was a really wonderful house. It still is a really wonderful house, um, but it, it hadn't received uh, much in the way of maintenance in a while. Faye had been unwell and uh, uh, they were both uh, getting on in years and it became very difficult. So in 2010, um, my uh, as a classroom exercise, I collected up a group of students and we documented that house uh, for the Historic American Building Survey, which is a fantastic um, um, compilation of documentation of historic buildings that is on the, the uh, when, when submitted, when the documentation is submitted, uh, ends up in the permanent uh, files archives of the Library of Congress. And so uh, you can imagine how appealing that is to students to be able to participate documenting historic buildings and having their own work having their own searchable work being, being uh, available at the Library of Congress. Um, so that was in 2010. In 2015, uh, uh, the uh, uh, heirs of Faye and Gus Jones, the Jones daughters, the, lo the lovely Tammy uh, Jones and her sister Janice Jones, uh, had the vision to donate the, their parents' house to the University of Arkansas and to the School of Architecture. Uh, that it would be preserved in perpetuity and would serve uh, as, as a base for academic work uh, uh, that was focused on historic preservation, particularly that of the modern movement in Northwest Arkansas, which is much more here than anybody would ever guess. Uh, and so uh, with that shift into the School of Architecture, uh, I came on board in a more in a more uh, organized way. Prior to that, I had been giving tours of the house whenever, uh, whenever I could, um, and uh, I took on my current role, which is the director of the Faye and Gus Jones House Stewardship. I, it's a long title, and I always have to think it through before I say it. Um, and in that role, uh, focused on the Jones House, I met my. A uh, good friend and colleague, Dave Gregor. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what the circumstances were when we first met, but uh, we very quickly realized that we had compatible goals in terms of uh, representing cultural uh, uh, events, uh, places, and such. Dave uh, will tell you much more about that. He's done uh, some really amazing work uh, doc uh, uh, recreating, should I call it? Uh, uh, Pompeii, uh, uh, and and uh, so the the possibility uh, arose that we could develop uh, a digital experience of the work of Faye Jones. Um, initially, our efforts uh, went towards uh, competing for a chancellor's grant. The full name of the grant is the. A collaboration and innovation fund. Thank you. Uh, we we were awarded that grant, and that really got the ball rolling. And as a as a uh, um, product of that grant, uh, we produced this first uh, kiosk, which you see on the screen here, which uh, was focused entirely on the Faye and Gus Jones house in Fayetteville. None no, none of his other works. Um, and it really was a labor of love uh, to create that. Um, it required uh, faculty, students, and other folks to spend time in the archives of uh, the University of Arkansas Mullins Library, where Faye Jones's papers are kept, um, and to really uh, 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 spend a lot of time on site in the house 
uh, doing a number of magical seeming uh, uh, moves that, again, Dave will tell you more about to help create these animated versions of, of this uh, architectural work. Well, we, we tested this kiosk. Uh, we displayed this kiosk. It was at Fayetteville Public Library for about a year during COVID. It was, it was in the library, kind of left behind for a little while. Um, the problem, well, there were, there were some problems with this early version and there were some, some really great things. The great thing was that people were really attracted to it. Uh, uh, it is amazing to me how uh, excited people get of all ages when they see Faye Jones's work. Uh, it speaks to people of all stripes. Uh, it really is something that has broad appeal. Um, the, the problem with it was this was a very, very heavy, uh, cumbersome apparatus. Uh, the frame was oak, the base was steel, and we really struggled to move it from place to place. So we decided uh, after the successes, but also some, well, we learned quite a bit from having done that first rendition. Come the second uh, round, we decided to compete for a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, grant, uh, which uh, uh, largely due to Dave's uh, wordsmithing, uh, we were able to uh, attain. So we had a, a much more, uh, we had a much broadened project in, for the second go round. And we were able to start considering uh, including more of Faye Jones's properties in the second rendition. As a matter of fact, we focused on two, uh, on four properties, four Faye Jones properties for the second rendition. We also strove to uh, make the kiosk itself, the physical manifestation of the work, a much more uh, user-friendly uh, um, apparatus. And that's what you see here tonight. We actually made two of them. One of them is, is still looking for a home. One of them is here uh, at, the, at the Shiloh Museum and we're grateful for that. Uh, it's a much more uh, um, uh, movable, portable uh, device, and it is uh, it includes much more information than the previous rendition. So what I'm going to do is go very quickly through some images of the the four properties that are included uh, on the kiosk, uh, and if you have questions about them. Uh, I'm happy to answer them uh, at the end. And I, as I said, I will do that fairly quickly. Now, um, these are in order by date. As I said, there are four properties. Um, the first being 1956, the last being about 1980. And um, they're arranged somewhat carefully. Uh, first, I'll talk about this uh, private home that is known more broadly as the Sequoia Project. This was a, a house uh, designed by Faye Jones uh, in about 1956. It was intended to be a speculative house that would uh, uh, allow for duplication, that it would be a, a, uh, a prototype for, uh, for a uh, subdivision. Uh, the subdivision never happened. And uh, but the one uh, prototype house remained. Uh, it is still uh, uh, there on Mount Sequoia. It's been lovingly uh, restored and enhanced by the current owners. Um, it is uh, per, uh, because it was very early in Faye's career, and because in part because it was a uh, speculative house. It's a much more simple rendition of Faye Jones's work. Now, for my taste. And I strictly, I underscore for my taste, I find uh, early work of, of Faye's particularly appealing to me because of its simplicity, because uh, budgets were tight uh, and uh, the work was much more reductive. It also comes at a time uh, in Faye's career, he was about 35 years old when this house was designed, that he's, he's reasonably fresh out of architecture school. Uh, and architecture school, when he was a student, was really steeped in post-war modernism. And so uh, his work of that time, uh, including his own house, certainly the Sequoia Project, which you're looking at, uh, brings in a lot of that um, modernist ethic fused with 
uh, his interest and and uh, experimentation with the ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Faye had worked in the office of Frank Lloyd Wright at uh, Wright's studio in Wisconsin, Taliesin East, in 1953. Uh, and uh, really that capped off his, uh, what had been to that point, a lifelong fascination with the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, so when he moved to Fayetteville and uh, began practice, he really started to infuse uh, the work with uh, a number of Wright's ideas, but also making sure to bring his own ideas to the to the table as well. So the Sequoia project, as, as you're seeing, is uh, covered in the in the animation. Um, and I think you'll like it. Um, the Fay and Gus Jones House in Fayetteville was also done in 1956. Now, the Fay and Gus Jones House was uh, Fay's first house in his uh, in his sol solo practice. Uh, as a student, he had worked on uh, perhaps five houses, five or so houses in Fayetteville. Uh, I believe four out of five of those houses still exist. Um, but this was the first house that Fay did. Uh, really with his own shingle hung out. Um, and it really is a marvelous house. Uh, it is also, uh, as I said, early in Faye's career. So it suffuses modernism uh, with uh, Faye's interest in Frank Lloyd Wright. It is very strongly related to the landscape. It, it has a very strong expression of Faye's interest in uh, two primary areas, caves and tree houses. Faye, as a kid, loved to loved to visit caves. Faye, as a kid, loved to build tree houses. And this, this house and a couple of others very strongly uh, exhibit that fascination that Faye had. Well, how does that happen? Well, the lower level of the house that you see here uh, is very rocky. It's, the space is very compressed. Uh, the spaces are somewhat dimmer maybe even a little bit humid. There is water rolling down the face of the rock that you see there. Um, and that's the cave portion of the house. The upper story of the house, when you go upstairs, the, the scene changes tremendously. Uh, it becomes uh, very light, very open. Uh, you can see the trees, you can see the landscape. The, the ceiling is lofted. And so upstairs becomes the tree house. And it's left to the visitor of the house to negotiate how those two things come together. Uh, in the end, it's, it's a very, very pleasing uh, experience. Uh, Gus Jones referred to the house as Faye's experiment. Uh, and uh, one of the thing, things that I take away from that is recognizing that the DNA of all of Faye's subsequent projects really are present in that house. And you can see it, you can pretty much trace a line very, very explicitly from that house to Thorn Crown Chapel and all of uh, Faye's, Faye's later work. Um, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, uh, you got a clock right there. Uh, when did I start? <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, okay. Five, five, seven, five, seven. Okay. So this is this is just a, a, a teaser. This image uh, on the uh, the um, the um, the work that you'll see from Dave. So I'm going to uh, skate past that very quickly. But you can see you can see comparing these images. Whoops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Comparing these images to the animated version, just how um, um, faithful to the to the uh, actual being building uh, the 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 um, animation is. This is a gentleman named Francis Carre, who is a uh, globally recognized architect from Africa, uh, uh, who won the Pritzker Prize recently, and we had the. Uh, delight of, of uh, having him speak at the School of Architecture. And, and uh, he was thrilled when I took him over to the Jones house uh, and walked around. But the space that you're seeing is the interior, the living space. And in the distance is the primary sleeping space for Faye and Gus Jones, uh, all open in, in a, a really a, a virtuoso of, of modern architecture that packs more architecture per square inch than just about any building I've ever been in. Uh, this is an animated view looking in the other direction of the house. Out towards the landscape. 
Stoneflower House. How many of you have heard of Stoneflower House? Stoneflower in Heber Springs, Arkansas, was was designed and built as a as a uh, vacation, a weekend house for the Shaheen and Goodfellow families that shared the house. Um, it's it's an amazing building. It's also especially notable for uh, serving very much as a proto Thorn Crown Chapel. And you, if you can't see that, let me point that out to you. Uh, um, uh, it's also distinguished by the fact that the lower level is very much a cave space. You can see the the uh, the very uh, pointer. I should use it. There's a, the very rocky base down below, and the very loft like tall space up above that. Um, you can see in this image the that cave space. Very very rocky rocks coming up through the floor, rocky walls, uh, and. In this house, there's a misregistration between the rocky stuff below and the and the wooden stuff above, and they kind of sit. Uh, one sits on the other, in a kind of a loose fit. And through that loose fit, there's light that's able to come in uh, at the perimeter, and you can just see that in this image. It's a little overexposed to see that, but you can see that at the edges. It's really an, an amazing, an amazing detail, and of course. Everybody's favorite detail in the house is the shower, um, which you see here. Uh, uh, and yes, the water does emerge from the rocks. Uh, you can stand under it and, and uh, recall the many Ozark waterfalls. Uh, a view of the interior space. You can see, just see the trusses at the ceiling. Uh, and again, if this isn't reminding you of Thorn Crown Chapel, uh, you need to go back to Thorn Crown Chapel. Uh, truly a, a wonderful space. And uh, Dave can tell you a little bit more about his personal experiences having spent uh, uh, a couple of nights in that house. Uh, a couple of quick views. Uh, this house was published in Life Magazine in 1963, I think. You're, you, I, is there a date on your, on your clippings? Okay, okay. Um, 1963, I think. Um, Again, you can very clearly see the, the thorn crown profile. Uh, you can see the trusses on the interior, uh, in this case, adapted to a, a living space. And then, of course, Thorn Crown Chapel in 1980. Um, uh, have you all been to Thorn Crown at some point? Is there anybody that hasn't been to Thorn Crown? It's time to go. Um, you, you need to go to Thorn Crown and you need to go to Cooper Chapel also in Bella Vista. At what to me as an architect and as an architecture teacher, it's important to see the two. One is steel, one is wood. And you can see how the ideas change according to the specifics of the material. And that's a that's it's it's a teachable thing, but it's also kind of a beautiful thing to see how the architect is thinking and and how he makes modifications to the materials according to the according to the to the to the limits of that material. Right, steel can be bent, uh, wood wood can be bent, but not easily and not on the scale of a of a very large building. Well, Thorn Crown was built. Uh, with with uh, off the shelf components primarily uh, that could be carried into into the site uh, easily by by a person without uh, th thus uh, providing as little disturbance as possible um, and and what a great space uh, it makes uh, the one of the innovations of this project uh, was is the uh, much celebrated voided joint where the uh, the trusses at the ceiling cross. Uh, and instead of it being a thickened condition where those two elements cross, well, by golly, it's voided out. And there's a, there's a piece of steel that holds the four pieces that leaves the center uh, open. Uh, this didn't happen in, in the, um, in um, uh, the, the, the earlier house that I showed you, um, I'm blanking, Stoneflower, Stoneflower thank you. Uh, um, it didn't happen in Stoneflower, but it does happen at, uh, at uh, Thorn Crown and uh, in a particularly wonderful way. And in this construction photo of Thorn Crown Chapel, you can see the, uh, in part, that, that lighting effect where the, the 
voids of the trousers start to line up and you get this, this uh, uh, beautiful succession of, of light carrying from the door to the altar of the space. And uh, a view of the interior for those of you that have seen it and those of you that haven't. Um, um, go when the light is low and long uh, and particularly golden. And uh, I think you'll you will have a, a, uh, a an experience that you'll remember the rest of your life. And with that, with a, a brief introduction to the four properties, uh, I will yield the floor to my colleague, Dave Frederick, and we'll tell you even more. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear and it's all good audio-wise. Okay, good. Uh, so as Greg said, we got a chancellor's grant to support this project back in 2017, 2018. Uh, we were fortunate to get an NEH grant, uh, a nice big one from the federal government. Um, in 2019, of course, that overlap as we started to put that project underway with COVID. And so that was one of the challenges we faced uh, in trying to get this project forward. Um, it's been an incredible project. And I use the present tense because these are living things. The houses of Faye Jones are living things. And this digital thing is still alive in the sense that we're still working on it. Um, and it's, it, you know, our, our team has gone from 22 to three because most of the work is done, but there's a lot of polish. Any digital project like this requires a lot of, uh, like about six months to eight months of polish change because everything breaks. You know, it's digital, it's interactive, things break. It's like, well, why is that broken? And then we gradually hunt down all the bugs, uh, we get them all fixed. And also things we just don't like visually. Some of that stuff we're stuck with, but there are some things we're definitely working on changing. So. We, uh, we had this giant, and we still have, in fact, this giant thing. And I should confess that we, I, I shouldn't say we, I nearly demolished the Fayetteville Public Library as we tried to move this in. Um, you know, Ryder Truck has this really tall ceiling. I forgot about that. Uh, so there was a little bit of a crash and some upset from Ryder and whatnot. Anyhow, this thing truly was a challenge to move around. This is, so this gives us a big one that can reside a long time at a place and two smaller ones. That was really, a, I think, a really good move on our part. But the key thing, um, and this will be, maybe you can read some of this text, but we wanted to take what we had done with Faye Jones, Faye and Gus Jones' house, and move that to four properties. And that means telling a story over those four properties, wherein Thorn Crown makes sense relative to those other three properties. And the other three properties are residential, and obviously Thorn Crown is a spiritual place. One of our, and I, I was working to create this with a team of probably average age of 20, 21. So these were students at the University of Arkansas, or recent graduates at the University of Arkansas. Uh, and we knew we wanted a game-like approach, and that's partly because, you know, a lot of kids these days are doing their learning through video games. Um, and video games have like can have a really bad reputation of like violent and you know uh, you know, shoot 'em ups. Um, so many games are not that, and as opposed to that, there are games that are really stepping forward as art forms in their own right. And kids, are twelve to you now thirty five or whatever, they're very attuned to that. They know that art is happening through video games. That it's not all about shoot 'em ups and violence and whatnot. And so really tapping into those, the sensitivities of these students and, and former students that were working at my, my game design studio, we really thought about how a game like, but like game like in the best sense of that word, like immersive and charming and surprising and all those things that make a game fun and not making the architecture of Faye Jones seems silly, which it certainly is not, but it is sometimes playful. And it's also mysterious. It blends the residential and the spiritual. And that's what we were going for. And this kind of looks like we're throwing those concepts at the wall in little boxes, right? So structure and dialogue with landscape, which you saw in the photos, that there's a porous boundary in these structures between nature and the built thing. So the built thing is kind of breathing along with the natural landscape. So we got to think about that. It's non-egocentric housing. So much of what we do in our culture, including with houses and cars and everything else, is very egocentric. 
It's designed to enforce your place as a superior thing in the landscape. Faye Jones buildings won't do that. At their best, they really challenge that notion. So it's a shelter that does not exclude nature, organic abstraction. That was a big thing for us. It seems like a contradiction in terms, like the organic is kind of rough and curvy and all those things. And abstraction seems like math, like, okay, abstraction is like hard edges and lines. But if you think about cave and treehouse, the cave is super bumpy and organic, right? And weedy. And the treehouse part's got these angular lines in it. And Faye keeps working those notions back and forth against each other. So we had to think about that. And we knew we wanted a game. And so the player should become increasingly suspicious because we have an orbit mode. If you ever get a chance, I think it has an automatic shutoff, but you'll see you're allowed to spin around above the house, take off its like the, the ceiling, then the first story, and then down to the bottom. You can see the whole thing, which gives you this sense of mastery over it, right from above. Well, we wanted to increasingly make the player wonder about that, that way of understanding these buildings and continue to force them back into the embodied person in that space, right? And to us, that started, and you can see us just like, oh, look at all these concepts. <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, so really what it came down to is, well, the cave is like the player in a certain condition. And the treehouse is like the player in a somewhat opposite condition. And Faye is moving them like this in a dialogue like that. So, um, you know, kids are smart. If you give them a chance, they're really smart. Uh, and I'll tell, uh, tell you one of the things that gave us a chance to be, I guess I'll say smart, is Greg, because he took us on a tour of these structures, which is one of the most mind-blowing experiences, uh, uh, like in a day, uh, of my life. You're seeing how these ideas evolve from structure to structure, and as us as game designers responding to Faye Jones as a space designer, an experienced designer, that really started to weave together in our heads, like we had something on our, like on our hands here. So we came up with what we call gameplay loops, which is what is the player going to do in this game? They're going to find stuff. Like they're going to find stuff inside these houses, like bits, of like a note card from Faye Jones, a sketch from Faye Jones, a picture of Faye Jones with Frank Lloyd Wright. They'll find these things. And every time they find a thing, it unlocks a next node. And what players want in gameplay is a reward. Right, and it's not going to be like Candy Crush, here's some stuff, like that kind of thing. What they're getting is information, and off it's and some of the phase note cards that you'll see are quite incredible, like to discover. The other thing is, is this house is let you turn stuff off and on, not just lights, even though he's crazy about lights. <laughs> like, like there's some six banks of lights, which is sometimes that happens, but also let's turn on the barbecue grills, let's light the fireplace, let's turn on the, the water feature that's in the house. Right, so introducing people to how these houses let you take part in them. Even a fireplace in a Faye Jones house, wow, it's like there's nothing that blocks that fire from out. It's just right there. And I'm like, wow, it's like, should be a screen or something, right? <laughs> but that's part of what he's doing is uh, like letting those boundaries go away. He's like, oh God, fire hazard. But he's like, the floor is stone, right? But that's part of bringing the natural into that contact with the personal, with the body. So we wanted to work with that. And the way that we did it, and this is basically, I'm sorry for the small type, but we thought the cave is a certain type of emotional condition of uh, being within one's own body and within that heavy space, thinking about oneself from the inside. And that meant a player coming to terms with some inner doubts and weaknesses. At the same time, the treehouse are like, that's kind of like standing outside of yourself. And we start off with a player who, in certain respects, has an um, inflated opinion of what they're good at. Right? And so bringing those, here I am, God, am I worthy to, I'm master. Right? And you think we all move between something like that and like that. Moving these into dialogue and allowing the person to recognize self-worth with in relationship to nature. And also recognizing the mystery that is nature, nature and in relationship to which you are very small and moving between those things. And that to us really unlocked the gameplay and what we were gonna do, okay? So um, I can't tell you how lucky I was to be along for the ride with these students as designers thinking this through, All right? And it's really quite poetic the way they responded to this architecture, which is what Faye Jones is invited to do. 
So we inverted the order. We got a chronological order. We got what we need is a, a narrative order for these houses, for these structures. Stone flower is a great start. It is so obviously decayed below, tree house above. It anticipate, anticipates at the end of the journey, um, thorn crown. Right? It's very clear, right? So that's a good place to start because it's a very strict, in a sense, almost straightforward statement of what we're going to work with. Then we put the phage at Fane Gus Jones house uh, together with the spec house that was never built beside it on the same property. We decided to go there next because, oh, he's restating. Actually, the chronological order is inverted a bit, but right, he's restating this, but now the house is more horizontal. We still have cave, tree house, but a failed spec house beside it. Like, which starts to point us to some things about Bay Jones' career. Bay Jones was unable to stop the advance of suburban schlock housing, right? That completely obliterates the landscape it's on. So that marched forward. And our student, like, and what we did was make the player a student architecture student, right? And what they are doing, they've been given an assignment in architecture school to go sketch these structures. So they're exploring each one of these structures and sketching throughout the game. And they discover, oh, well, you know, Faye Jones is a super cool architecture. What does it mean now? Right? Does it, does it impact the history of like residential architecture, which is catastrophic in the United States? Is it that? So coming up against that loss and the sense that frustration there vis-a-vis -vis the larger context of American development. So that's kind of a dip, shink, right, in the narrative arc. And we wanted that up and then down. Then encountering Sequoia, also a failed development. And that's, it doesn't become a big housing development. People don't build like a whole bunch of those houses. At the same time, for all of its brick simplicity, Sequoia is amazing. And it does some incredibly clever things in Sequoia. It's a long house that way. So you think, where's the tree? Tri the cave, where's the tree house? What happened? All right? And what you get is up against the top of that house, which seems like the top is actually up against the hillside. It feels like the cave, but it's higher. Then you go down and it opens up into the trees. And I'm like, well, this is now the tree house and that's what happened, right? So he flips some things around and then gives you a long appendage with light coming in from the side, from the side, from the side. Right, so it's a very, I think, an extremely simple but clever. He's good at that. A kind of simple cleverness about it. So it's a tremendously successful house, though it doesn't spawn this development that was hoped for. That sets us up for the next rise up, which is obviously going on at the end. So we wanted this kind of narrative arc and movement. So now, having said those things, the other thing we got to do is think about where the player is inside each floor plan. Like, so we want some nodes in here, like how they entered the house, or I guess how they entered the house, because this is inverted, by the way. Right, so the actual front door of Stone Flower faces up this hill and then up to a golf course, but everyone comes in from the back these days. So it's kind of flipped around, but just like, okay, they land there, they sketch there, they explore here, they find stuff here, they go there and sketch again, more yeah. sketching out on the deck, and then finally up to the incredible suspended bedroom that's up close to these crossing struts inside Stone Flower. Thinking about each one of those nodes, which is thinking through the choreography of how Faye Jones moves you through a house. So super fun to bat these ideas back and forth. And we've been to Stoneflower, right? So we spent about, we spent three nights there in total. And it was amazing. We found ourselves reflecting from within Stoneflower. Hey, we're all sitting here kind of where I think he directed us to be sitting right now, <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, we naturally gathered here. We naturally gathered there. Then we notice other things like I spent about 15 minutes all by myself over in this nook. Because he let you do that. Right? He let you engage in the community and he let you withdraw from it. And this architecture choreographs these in movements into the group and away from the group, which we found fascinating, among other things. Uh, the loft is indescribable that you're sleeping up there suspended, like in this chapel like ceiling. Incredible. So that was really, really fun. And it, I'd like to show you a little bit of the program as it exists right now, but I'm a little scared, right? In case I lose our online audience. So we're just gonna have some fun with computers as we so often do these days. So I'm gonna hit the escape button. Uh, 
And oh, look at me tabbing around. Oh, look at that could be Chrome right there. That's awesome. Uh, let's look at this. Okay, now do I have to share again? Like, okay, so if I go back over to Shiloh Museum or Zoom, aha, like that, right? Okay, oh goodness gracious. I can't see my mouse. Is it, oh, uh, 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 oh. So if I hit there, right? I do that and I stop the share or I click on a different share. Let's, oh, that looks like it's about to do it. Is it still, it's still sharing that, right? Okay. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. I'm so glad you're here. But now of course you don't see anything. <laughs> That's less positive. Um, let me let me regather myself and pull this mouse over this way. Let me move this. Believe me, the excitement will be back in just a second. I swear to God. Let's grab this and see if it will move over that way or move over that. Hey, hey. Okay, that's fantastic. Now I just need to do this. Well, maybe I need to move it over just a little bit wacky over there. This is okay. You can imagine how my students felt about me in these moments. Okay, it's loading. That's that's really good. Okay, so this is going to load up, and this is totally playable through your browser, which is what we wanted. We knew we didn't want a game console or any of these things that throw barriers between this project and a public able to play it, because only so many people can play a kiosk. So we wanted to have this, in a sense, be shareable that way. So this is playing right through your browser. You could play it, you know. Uh, now we're going to start this game. Oh, my God. Look, you can't do anything but go to Stoneflower first. And it's loading up. Look at it. Think about it. And I had to think about it because, let me close that. This is actually a 360 video. Right, or, or still. And it's kind of, um, what we wanted to do was actually start to play at Yellow Rock, right? Because it's a gripping piece of Arkansas landscape. And so we wanted to start there. The student's like, why do I have this dumb assignment to sketch this stone? Right, so they're in that position. Um, and we just, I'm just gonna lead you quickly through sort of the dialogue of this person. Like, huh, architecture school, really hard work and a ton of coffee. I'm losing my mind. I'm gonna go out as students do. They go out into the Arkansas landscape to recover from what we make them do. So that is, and you can see you're getting a little like, hey, maybe you should click that. And the students like in that moment of thinking about themselves, like some of my colleague students, like they'll just go to the edge, whether that edge is actual yellow rock where I have seen people sitting there with their legs over the edge. And I'm like, God, no, please don't, <laughs> no, All right? But some people are that way. Right, and some architecture students are that way. They go right to the edge of the assignment and take risks. And this student's like, I don't know if I've got that in. Right, so that inward questioning self. Right, so um, let me, I'll go through this a little more quickly. So you're, I think you're getting the hang of it. So you, and then you click on these things and they bring up either dialogue or objects. And as you move your gaze across this landscape, you encounter your assignment, right? And you think, well, sometimes you have to really take risks to succeed. And that's starting to dawn on the student that that's challenging. It includes the idea of failure. Okay, and then we get the assignment from our teacher who's fictional named Wendell Stoner. And that's it. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Seriously. And so... <laughs> Uh, and Wendell is like, hey, you need to go out and draw these things. And the student's like, why am I drawing a thing? Like, why is that? So, well, are you just not going to do it? Oh, maybe I need to. Ah, I see. Uh, so, and then the student is like, backwoods Ozarks, backwoods assignments. Does this guy think we're going to involve clients in the architectural work that we do through sketching? What an absurdly old fashioned idea, right? But except that it's not. Like those traditional skills with pen or pencil and paper are still absolutely where it's at in architecture. You cannot blow that away with some kind of machine, right? And actually that involves physical engagement with the medium, right? And that's your body at work, so important. So we definitely, so we wanted to juxtapose that, the notion of sketching with a video game and approaching the architecture of Faye Jones. So that was our move. And let's see if we're gonna, hey, you made it. Okay, I see a little guy over here, click on that. And this is your first sketch and I'm gonna set this up. What do I do? Oh yeah, uh, okay, okay, uh, no. I'm supposed to draw the edge. 
hey, I should be done, but okay, I got to keep looking. So that's important. And the fact that you completed this opens a sketchbook and says, the first sketch, you did it, right? So as if you were actually drawing the thing, of course you're not, because that would be hard. And so next we can continue and this will get us into, I know this is kind of cool. <laughs> so there's stone flower in its setting. It's a little too aggressive. It's a little like technicolor glowing. We know. <laughs> so we're like, man, what is up with these dreams? They're so purple. And so as vibrant as the red bud or whatever it can be, we need to, like, we're, we're like, ah, that needs to come back, right? So we're kind of working with those color values right now. Uh, then your next task will, of course, be, well, let's go to the next note. Can we do that? Yes, we can. That's fantastic. Then maybe we can draw a thing. What a challenge. Oh, my God. What? So you have to think, how will this go? Okay, up, around, around. Am I doing this right? Am I good? Uh, I'm not done. What is that? Uh, uh. Where's our last node, you guys? Up in the eaves. Up in the eaves. Oh, I see it now. That's why we did things this way. That's intentional. Because we're trying to get people to look carefully and think how this is working as a shape. I know that we didn't cut across the deck. We had to inscribe it in a circle. That is intentional because Faye will make you move in recur like recursive circles to his house, like, like this, and then like that, and around like that, and back like that. So within 1,200 square feet, you get like a million decisions to make spatially. Really cool. So I think that you've got the idea now. And so what I'm going to do is... Oh my God, I'm going to go back over here. Can I? Yeah, I can. What if I hit play? We were just looking at that. So we got through the playthrough, and now I'm just going to say this is what happens when you go on the deck of Stone Fire. You begin your sketching and discovery, sketching and discovery. And I'm going to just cut from what you're asked to do outside, which is frame this pretty obvious shape. Then you make your way inside. Um, wow. Right, this forces you to come to terms with like the complexity of what is happening. Or what, where do I draw next? And not get a red. Okay, so you know it's like, oh, I bet if I go around the central lantern and then around that feature, I'll, I'll do it. But it's forcing you to come to terms with what's there in that respect. If you then go to Thorn Crown, like just skipping the other two structures, because this is brought out and brought out and reinforced and reinforced. When you get to Thorn Crown, even though like we're not super happy about the textures on these trees, but we're very happy about the way their branches cross, <laughs> right? Because that's a commentary on that, and that's a commentary on that, right? And now you're being asked to draw this soaring structure all the way around, kind of the way that you drew back, back in the past gameplay, uh, the Stoneflower facade, and you're repeating that thing. Okay, so that structure is now very much like that other structure, but trees have been brought in closer, more aggressively, which they are there, and especially in winter. To me, it's most magical in the winter time. I got to be honest. That's because of all those tree branches and what's happening with the tracing of the wood inside, which looks like tracing, but is actual structural holding stuff up. Super cool. So maybe like that. And there's a great quote from Faye about the intricate ballet of the structure that a photo cannot capture. I love that quote from him. But that's why you sketch, because the organic vivacity of a sketch starts to capture that motion that's in the architecture in a way a photo can't do it. Right, so I love that quote from him. And like, it, like this is a straight shot. I mean, I'm not being asked to make any turns or anything like any fancy housing floor plan. Like what's happening? It's very straightforward. So much of your complexity and turning and spinning around is happening up here. How you try to digest that with your eye. And you also imagine your body's up there. Right? What would, what would my viewpoint be if I could be there, up there? And in fact, Faye already said you were already up there in Stoneflower, man. Right? That's where the bed was. Right? So that's a move he's got built in. And so we thought about that a lot. And the way that stuff is all coming together, the weight seems to dissolve. That's the point of the void joint, right? So everything seems to come together only 
that's all, which means you just move that. That's that. Okay, so your sort of eye interest intensity moves like, oh, can I go or no? I go, right. And so we're like, what can we do with that kind of situation? Sketching wise, we can introduce, oh, yeah, told you, stuff is incredible. Like, what does an architect have to work with? That's one of the most important things. Light. This is Faye Jones telling me this. And I'm like, and he's really giving away the secrets, like right there. And so when we, these cards are like cards he used to deliver lectures, right? Underscoring for himself the key stuff. So we thought that was super cool. And then, oh, okay, so we're going to do this. And we're going to allow... It's like we're missing. Whoa, so uh, look at all the crossing now that you as the sketcher are being invited to do following all the tracery of this work. So you went around and around and around and up and around. And then these guys, these vertical elements going back down, they don't go to the ground, right? So the stuff is going like that, uh, uh, boom, floats. What you thought was gonna pull you down actually floats. Meanwhile, you're down there sitting in these really shallow cues, right? So you're very close to the ground looking up at that, which puts your eye right at the wall level. That's the cave. It's still happening. So to us, this was like, wow. And what would we like to do with our person? Let me go back a slide or two. One, maybe one more. It's like it's making decisions on its own. That's the one. What we could do in the game engine and this camera is put you, in fact, in the line of all of those things. Yeah. Check that out. Yeah. No, no, you can't. I'm, you'd have to take a really tall ladder in there, right, to try to do this. But he's inviting your mind to be there throughout, to take that, like, super, like, incredible vantage point and see actually how all these line up, like diamonds or the eye of a needle. Super cool. So when it dawned on us, we could actually put the camera there like, yeah, that is where this game is going to end is right there. So that's what we did. And you sketched it through and then back out to the outside of Thorn Crown, where you can see these upper ones, as Greg pointed out, they're actually above this one. But as your eye moves through, they overlap and become a single structure, single sort of void space. So uh, to me, the even though there's like many technical things we're fixing about this game, conceptually, I'm so happy about where it went, how it got there. And obviously this whole conceptual journey that a bunch of kids like 20 years old uh, at the University of Arkansas took, that was on the wings of Faye Jones, right? And that to me, we're using 21st century technology to engage with, not to overcome or be superior to or any of those things, right? It's really just a dialogue with one, like with this technology and that designer. And to me, it was incredibly rich and rewarding. So I have to put the students' faces. I told you they were young. Not that guy, <laughs> but all these other people, they all touched this project in one way or another. Now we're down to three, but this was really quite a team effort. And during COVID, when we have to leave our studio and work remotely, that all happened. So that was a challenge. And also two students from architecture, had a direct role in making these kiosks. So I want to recognize them as well. And it's just, it's just the greatest thing that one of them, Ethan William Bellamy, is in Saint Chapelle, which was the direct inspiration for Thorn Crown and Stoneflower. So it's a really cool picture, right? So yeah, so that's what we got. And thanks so much for coming and attending this and everything. So. I guess we we have time for questions. We do. Yeah. And as, as you're thinking of questions, I want to put in a plug uh, real quickly for um, uh, in my role as the director of the Faye and Gus Jones House Stewardship, uh, I conduct public tours of the Faye and Gus Jones House. Um, I do that on demand, and if you demand it, I will provide. It. Uh, this, this is strongly recommended. Yeah, yeah. Um, I try and consolidate, obviously, so I, because I, I do have other duties as well. But but it, one of my thrills is being able to to bring groups through the house. My the best way to get in contact with me is my email, and I will now tell you my email. 
It is G Herman, G H E R M A N at U A R K dot E D U. Email me and we'll set something up. Um, and uh, you all know that uh, Cammy Jones, who grew up in the house, is here with us tonight. <laughs> And uh, so we, I thank her endlessly. But uh, yeah, come on out to the house. And, uh, it is along a hill. Uh, uh, it, is, it is behind exactly. that one hill yeah. on, on Hillcrest. 13, 1330 Hillcrest. Yeah. <laughs>